Well, good afternoon. This pandemic has touched all of us, and it's touched every part of our daily lives. So much has changed in such a short period. And now more than ever, staying connected is essential. Staying connected over the internet has never been more important to workers, students, families, and friends. Internet connection is the difference between carrying on with our daily lives or not. Reliable, high-speed internet is no longer a luxury. It's an absolutely essential part of our life. Internet connection is something that too many of us take for granted. But there's still hundreds of thousands of people in Ontario who lack this critical infrastructure. 12% of Ontario communities still don't have access to reliable internet service. That's 620,000 families, businesses, and households. This is something we've been working on since we took office. Well before the outbreak of COVID-19, I made it my personal mission as Premier to improve the state of our rural broadband in Ontario. Last year, we announced our broadband and cellular action plan. Our government made a historic commitment of $315 million to build better broadband infrastructure for rural Ontario. We have the shovels in the ground on a number of projects that Minister Scott will speak to you in a moment about. Today, we're taking another step forward. We're investing $150 million to improve broadband and cellular connectivity in Ontario. This money will go directly to expanding broadband and cellular access to more families and businesses in rural Ontario and remote areas. We're partnering with municipalities, indigenous communities, and the private sector to deliver these critical projects. Through this new program, we have the potential to attract up to $500 million in total with partner funding. Everyone is at the table and we need the federal government there too. We need the federal government to deliver on its commitment to rural broadband because we can't do it alone. People in our rural communities deserve the same level of service that the rest of Ontario enjoys and relies on every day. Making these historic strategic investing investments now will lay a strong foundation for our future. It will lay a strong foundation for our economic recovery, for a better quality of life for everyone, and for the long-term prosperity of our province. Thank you, and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'll pass it over to Minister Scott. Thank you, Premier. Today is an exciting day. Today's announcement is another piece of the broadband puzzle. But there is much more work to be done. This provincial broadband program continues the ongoing commitment of our government to expand broadband service to unserved and underserved parts of Ontario. As someone from rural Ontario who lives this experience firsthand, I know the digital divide is real. Today, we are announcing a $150 million provincial broadband program that will leverage up to $500 million in broadband investment expansion into underserved and unserved communities across Ontario. The first project submission intake will open this summer. This builds on the $315 million plan that the Premier and I announced last July. The Southwest Integrated Fibre Technology Broadband Program, known as SWIFT, is well underway to expanding broadband connectivity in communities like Lambton, Wellington and Norfolk counties. The Eastern Ontario Regional Network, also known as EORN, is in the process of ending cellular gaps and dead zones in Eastern Ontario. We have also invest invested in the North with the Matawa First Nation, along with other Northern projects and First Nations in the past year. Is it enough? No. Will we do more? Yes. But today is a very good step, a step that moves us forward in connecting Ontarians but it is a journey that we cannot take without the support of our federal partners. Today, we are calling on the federal government to step up and help us expand connectivity to everyone across Ontario. 
We all deserve the opportunity to join the economy of the 21st century. Thank you. I will now pass it over to Minister Lecce. Well, good afternoon. And let me first off start by acknowledging uh, Minister Scott for her leadership and her advocacy for expanding internet access in every region of our province. Now, we know that the future prosperity of our province and our country depends on our ability to fully embrace the digital economy and digital learning. Le moment est venu de combler les fossés numériques. We believe it is time to close the digital divide. The next generation of Canadian thinkers, of innovators and entrepreneurs need to be connected to the global marketplace. And that's why in the Ministry of Education, we are taking action. First, the government, this government is ensuring that internet is in every high school by this September, every elementary school by the following September. And just as an update, and for broadband modernization is now completed in over 2,000 schools so far. This will be vital as we plan for all eventualities for the fall. Second, we have partnered and leveraged opportunities with telecommunications sector to deliver low-cost, high-impact technological solutions. For example, over 200,000 computers have been distributed by school boards. Over 21,000 new iPads have been purchased and sent to students with internet for free. Now, third, as Minister Scott recently mentioned, uh, her and I have called on the federal government to further commit to funding broadband. We've called on them to accelerate funding, to reach those communities within our province that are pleading for this technological capability. Now, finally, we know, we recognize that technological fluency is a competency that our students need in this disruptive and increasingly competitive economic landscape. It's why we continue to make the case for live, dynamic, synchronous learning to provide a sense of community with their educators and their peers in this difficult time. Now, parents want more of that and will continue to support their voices and the voices of their students who want a better education. Our mission in our work is all about ensuring Ontario students retain a competitive advantage that leads them to good paying jobs right here in Ontario. Thank you. We'll go to the phone line for questions. First question. First question comes from Lucas Meyer from News Talk 1010. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, thanks for taking our questions once again. Premier, I'm just wondering if you're going to be asking, it's been some time, will you be asking the health table to provide updated projection numbers, both for cases and deaths? Well, I'll pass that over to the, the minister. Thank you. Well, we do receive uh, information on the cases uh, based on geography every single day. We are looking, of course, for a downturn in the numbers. This information is, of course, to, communicated to the, uh, to the Premier's office. And we're looking at uh, where there might be hot spots, where there might be breakouts, where we can send our, uh, our mobile teams or our um, pop-up teams to be able to deal with some of those hot spots. Uh, we are looking at a variety of areas around the province right now. And I did have the opportunity to actually see this pop-up uh, assessment center in action yesterday. There was one that was in Scarborough to do testing of people who wanted to be tested because they had symptoms that were uh, COVID related or they were concerned that they had been in contact with someone with COVID. Uh, this is a very, uh, it's a very professional group. They had eight stations set up. They had the appropriate nurses there that were ready to go. Very uh, seasoned nurses that have a lot of experience. And there was also, I can tell you, uh, a lineup half an hour in advance, people waiting to be tested. So we are continuing our testing and we are going to continue our reporting in, in a very open and transparent manner. That's all great, but the question was regarding if there's going to be any updated you know, projections over the short and long term uh, going forward, both for cases uh, and deaths. I'm just wondering if that's something that, that, that uh, the Premier or yourself uh, is looking at releasing uh, in, the, in the coming perhaps weeks or so. Uh, may I ask, do you mean in terms of modelling or are you looking at actual numbers that were projected? Correct. For, for you know, models going forward, uh, you, you, that was done back in, uh, in April, I believe, where you suggested yeah. there could be this many cases and this many deaths. I'm just wondering if there's going to be updated modelling numbers going forward. Uh, there will be modeling pr uh, that will be provided on, uh, on a regular basis. Right now, we're just waiting to see where the numbers are as we prepare to launch into stage two at the appropriate time. Uh, but when the appropriate time comes for modeling, that uh, we will, of course, have it done, and we will, of course, provide it to you in an open and transparent manner. Next question. 
Next question comes from Randy Rath from CHCH TV. Please go ahead. Hi, Randy. Yeah, hi, Premier. Um, I, I'm wondering, um, New York State has come up with an agreement with uh, CVS pharmacies to operate um, testing centers in 60 pharmacies in that state. Is, is that a model that Ontario should be following in our existing pharmacies to uh, make testing more widespread? Well, we're in conversations right now with some of the largest uh, pharmacies, and uh, just stay tuned over the next little while. We'll be uh, possibly rolling that out if that uh, comes to fruition. I think it's a good model. Follow up. Okay, um, and, and this is probably best for Mr. Lecce. Um, the Quebec model, or the Quebec has shown when they, when they put, let schools open again, that 41 cases of COVID presented in the schools. Um, is, is, is that something that is inevitable? Um, should Ontarians expect COVID to spread in the schools once they open? I think what the what parents should expect is that the government is going to take every single precaution possible to keep the children safe. It is the basis, Randy, why we closed schools in this province, the first in the country, and it's why they continue to be closed, because we made an assessment of risk and uh, made a commitment to parents that we would never, the Premier was clear, we would never compromise the safety of our youngest learners. And so we will learn from jurisdictions who made that decision, and to be fair, British Columbia and, and Quebec, they have very different models, very different times that COVID hit their provinces. We made a made in Ontario decision based on the best scientific and medical minds informed by the command table, but also informed by sick kids. So really some global research, global leaders in the area of the maintenance of health for our kids. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna play, build out that plan, release it to the public in June, by the end of June, and give some certainty to everyone that we're coming up with a plan that will keep your child safe, but allow them to return in the fall. That is the plan for September. Um, and obviously build a protocol that gives confidence to parents, but also to our staff as well. Next question. Next question comes from Colin DeMello from CTV News. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, Premier. It Hi, has been quite a while since we've heard any movement on the economic front. I'm just wondering, are we at this point ready to enter stage two? And if not, can you give us a, a more of a, um, an exact time frame for when that, we can take that next step? Well, I, I just want to be clear, uh, first of all, Colin, with the state of emergency, that's not going to slow us from uh, moving forward, getting the economy going and uh, moving forward with uh, stage two. And it's uh, front of the health table right now. And hopefully uh, over the next uh, week, we'll be able to uh, discuss that with the, uh, the people of Ontario. Okay, thank you. And in the interim, is there any update on restaurants being allowed to open their outdoor patios? It's you know we're we're right in the middle of uh, those those typical uh, you know prime drinking hours. Uh, it would be really nice for people to be able to go on a patio outdoors and those restaurants to be able to make some income. Um, is there any update on that front? Well, that's one of the areas that we're looking at uh, with the regional opening, and we had a, a real good conversation with caucus and. And cabinet. I know a lot of people in the rural areas uh, want that. That's at the, the health table right now, and they'll make those uh, decisions uh, within uh, the week, and we'll be able to come out to the public and, and discuss that. Next question. Next question comes from John McGrath from TVO. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Premier. Hi, John. The Globe and Mail is reporting today that only 16,000 businesses across the country have uh, applied for the federal and uh, provincial uh, commercial rent assistance program. And I'm wondering if that uh, relatively low level of uh, applications means that uh, the government, uh, the Ontario government, will be considering any kind of measures to uh, encourage more uh, businesses to apply, like BC has. Uh, made uh, application uh, a condition of any future uh, commercial evictions. Well, John, uh, they they opened it up last Tuesday, so it's been a and it's been a week right now. And I've, you know, asked, I've begged the, the landlords to to work with the tenants. Uh, these are struggling uh, businesses. These are small, uh, family-run businesses in a lot of cases, and and uh, they're they're hurting right now. And I've asked them and asked them and. Uh, to work with them, and it's a great deal. We put over, along with the federal government, put over a billion dollars uh, to to help them out, and and we would take 50% of that with the federal government, and the, the landlord uh, would be asked to, to pay the 25%, and the tenant would be uh, asked to pay 25%. 
and they're just refusing to do it. Well, what, what they're doing is they're, they're testing me, and uh, that's going to be the wrong thing to do. Uh, we'll give it a few more days, and then uh, we'll act. So all the landlords out there, uh, you, you want to play hardball? We'll play hardball then, because I'm going to protect the little guy. I'm going to protect the little business businesses out there that are struggling. And, uh, you know, may, 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 maybe you don't realize how it is to struggle. Maybe you don't realize when you have a, a, a family in there trying to meet payroll uh, every single week and trying to meet their budgets, and all of a sudden COVID comes along and, and knocks you off your feet. It's hard enough to survive for small business owners as it is uh, in, in, uh, without COVID. Now with COVID, and they want to keep uh, pushing us, well, stay tuned. Uh, you'll, you'll get what you ask for. I, I promise you that. Thank you for that. And, and I know that the government is now looking at, at a more sort of regional idea of, of reopening uh, based on local conditions. But we're also now this week seeing more uh, hot spots in terms of rural areas, uh, you know, agricultural workers uh, getting more infections. Uh, given that this is, at least this week, not uh, as much of a GTA story and it's more in rural areas than we've seen before, does that change your thinking at all in terms of yeah. uh, allowing a, uh, a, a more regionally focused reopening? Well, we've seen a spike with the uh, migrant workers, temporary workers uh, that have come here, and I'll, I'll tell you what we've done. We immediately uh, acted on it, and we had 137 uh, inspectors, labor inspectors, go to the farms to inspect it. We put 34 orders out. We also gave the farmers $2 million to protect their workers, and you know, so I, I love those farmers. They work their backs off, so they're doing everything they can to, uh, you know, make sure that they have a safe working environment. It doesn't matter if it's migrant workers or workers that are here, everyone has a responsibility to protect them. And uh, we're gonna support the farmers, but uh, we're gonna continue on with the inspections. Uh, we also uh, have asked Ontario Health to set up a, a program uh, to make sure that we go out to these farms and, and get these uh, workers tested. It's, it's critical to, for the safety of the, the supply chain, the food supply chain as well. So we're, we're all over this. We didn't wait a second. We have the inspectors out there already. Next question. Next question comes from Cynthia Mulligan from City News. Please go ahead. Hi there, Premier. Hi, Cynthia. Uh, I'd like to talk more about the migrant workers. And I guess my question is, um, I've seen the conditions that they work in, very tight quarters, very tight living quarters, yeah. uh, as well as work. So what precautions, preventative precautions were taken because clearly there weren't enough and were they given PPE prior and do they have PPE now? Well I've been on uh, many farms and I've, I've seen the, the living conditions. We've given them over two million dollars uh, for PPE and also if they, they need to do uh, renovation to make sure that the, the workers are, are separated and not living in a congregate uh, a living environment. Uh, so we're, we're going to stay on top of this and we're going to be uh, uh, working hard with the farmers to, to protect the workers. But are you aware, do all the workers currently have PPE right now? Well, they've had $2 million to buy the PPE and hopefully the farmers have and that's the reason we sent uh, in the inspectors and we had 137 farms inspected already in a short period of time. Uh, we're going to continue to... Uh, going in there and inspecting all the farms and uh, we handed out 34 orders so I'm, I'm hoping and I have confidence in farmers uh, you know they're, they're great people so I'm, I'm sure uh, their number one priority is to protect their workers because without protecting their workers they won't be able to get their crops out so I, I know the farmers are good people and they're going to do everything they can next question next question comes from Sean Jeffers from the Canadian press please go ahead Good afternoon, Premier. Hi, Sean. Just to follow up on uh, Cynthia's questions about uh, migrant workers, um, some groups that are advocating for farmers uh, say that there's actually a labor shortage uh, across the province um, because of COVID-19. It's been it was there existing before the pandemic, but it's yeah. been exacerbated because of some of these outbreaks and um, the uh, the fact that there are travel restrictions in place for the workers. Um, I'm wondering, is the province considering creating a program like Quebec's where it tops up worker wages to incentivize Ontarians who are out of work during the pandemic to take up jobs on farms that they might not otherwise? 
Well, we've had this, this discussion, and even before this uh, pandemic, uh, we were short, just in Ontario, over 250,000 workers to fill uh, positions uh, right across this, this province. And I've talked to many farmers uh, about this. I, I believe, I, I think it's close to 32,000 migrant workers come in. We've worked with the federal government when they first came in to self-isolate -isol for, for a two-week period. Uh, but it's something that I'll sit down with the Minister of Agriculture. And once we get the economy uh, going, hopefully we're going to be in the same position as we were before COVID-19. We'll need 250,000 more, more people to, to fill the jobs of uh, requested before COVID-19 to the Prime Minister to uh, increase uh, people coming into the, the country because we need them. And uh, I've always said, no matter if they're skilled or unskilled, if they're unskilled, we'll train them. And if they're skilled, well, that's even better. Uh, we'll put them in the right uh, area for their, their uh, expertise. Premier, this, uh, follow, this follow up might actually be better for uh, the Minister of Education. Um, and it, it's a, a bit of a continuation on the questions that Randy Rapp was asking earlier. Um, you know, I'm wondering if you can share more of your plans for the return to school in September. I know parents are very curious. Uh, your framework mentions that schools need to open and or may need to open and close throughout the year because of COVID. How would that work? And will you be postponing EQAO for another year? Well, the, the plan and the intention as we have communicated to date is that working with the best medical and scientific minds in the country, we've put together a team that's informing cabinet on how to reopen, what those protocols should look like. I don't want to get ahead of that process because to be fair, we're continuing to consult not just with medical and scientific minds, but with educators, with parents, and of course with students about what that should look like. The emphasis, of course, and the default of the government is gonna be the safety of our youngest learners. We're gonna ensure and do whatever it takes as the Premier has been so clear to keep these children and the staff safe in our schools. So uh, it's not an attempt to avoid the substance of the question, just to be quite frank, I'm better, I'll be better positioned to answer that in the coming weeks once that consultation has landed. What I can assure parents is there will be a protocol that will ensure the safety of kids. And we are looking at you know, all options on the table. Now, you are right to note that there could be risk, of course, in the fall in the context of uh, a second wave or other um, types of challenges that we have to be ready for in the government. And we are planning for those eventualities. It's why today, uh, to be quite frank, why it is so necessary for all governments, particularly the federal government, to step up investment in technology and in broadband, because in the absence of you know, bridging that gap. If we don't, you know, connect young people, the next generation of our students and our thinkers and our workers to the internet, we are going to, in some respects, deny them the access to learning that they deserve in this province in 2020. And the federal government, the CRTC, made a commitment to get connectivity to every Canadian. We want them to do it, and we want them to do it as soon as humanly possible. There's a clear economic imperative. There's a pedagogical one as well from an educational perspective. And we're looking forward to them stepping up to deliver those investments with the province, with my colleague, Minister Scott, to get those dollars out the door. Let's get every student, every family, and every community connected to the internet so that no matter what happens in the fall, we're ready and kids can continue to be safe and learn. Next question. Next question comes from Antonella Artuso from the Toronto Sun. Please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, Premier. Hi, Antonella. I wanted to... Hi, I wanted to ask you about post-secondary education. There appears to be a lot of questions, a lot of ambiguity uh, with the fall semester looming. Uh, students have said perhaps they should have the option of lower tuition or, or even postponing their acceptance letters for a year. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I'm more than happy to sit down with the, the minister and uh, have that discussion. I know he's really engaged with all the colleges and university, he speaks to them on a, on a daily basis. And if there's anything uh, we can do to help the students, uh, we'll be there for them because they, they're, gonna, they're gonna need some help. But uh, I have all the confidence in the world in uh, Minister Romano. Follow up. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to ask about the social bubble as well. The Chief Medical Officer of Health talked uh, about possibly expanding that beyond uh, one household. And I'm wondering if that is imminent and if also you would consider rolling back uh, social distancing measures or public health measures on a regional basis. So for instance, yeah. somebody in Kenora might have three households in their social bubble and yeah. somebody in Toronto might just have one. Yeah, good question. I'll pass it over to the Minister of Health. 
Well, thank you for the question. That is something that we are certainly considering, of course, as we move into the next stage and consider when it's going to be appropriate to move into stage two. As you know, right now, there is a limit of five people with whom people can be associated and, and uh, we want to be able to expand that as we expand our economy to expand our society as well. So we are looking at what the appropriate number is. That's something that Dr. Williams and the, uh, the health command table is discussing as we are discussing amongst our, our, our group of uh, cabinet members and caucus members as well. So we want to do this uh, whenever we do proceed with it in a very cautious and measured way. It is a very important public health principle, however, that you, when you do start expanding, you do so gradually because if you do limit the number of people that um, uh, others that you can associate with uh, without physically distancing yourself, then if something happens, if there is a, a breakout, if someone does um, a, a contact or um, come down with COVID-19, then the contact tracing is going to be much easier. So it is something that we are seriously considering because it is one of the fundamental principles of, of good public health policy. Next question. Next question comes from Rob Ferguson from the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi, Rob. Hi, Premier. Um, this is one that you might want to pass to uh, Minister Elliott, but sure. uh, I'm always welcome to hear what you think of this. Um, I, I've been thinking about what, what's going to happen to long-term care homes in the coming weeks. Uh, June 12th, the Canadian Armed Forces medical teams leave. Um, hospitals at some point are going to have to, I'm assuming, are going to have to pull some of their teams out of long-term care homes as, as hospital uh, procedures and whatnot return to normal. So what are you doing to get long-term care homes ready for the second wave in the fall? Well, we're certainly not going to uh, leave them without assistance. Uh, when the Canadian Armed Forces leave, then we do have hospitals that are already working with the, uh, the long-term care homes in question. And, and you are correct in that we do want to return to um, uh, uh, procedures that have been booked in advance for uh, cancer surgery, heart surgery, um, hips and knees and so on. But our first priority is making sure that the very vulnerable populations in our long-term care homes are properly provided for, that there is enough staff there in order to be able to care for infection prevention and control, and to help them to, uh, to be fed, to uh, be, uh, achieve the appropriate hygiene, to be able to receive liquids and so on in a safe way from professionals. So we are going to continue to support them from hospitals. And as far as the uh, procedures are concerned, we are taking a look at how we can return to those procedures in a regional way. So if there is one hospital in a region that is providing support to a long-term care home, uh, there may be another hospital that is able to proceed with the surgeries. And so surgeons may be moved from one hospital to another in order to be able to start getting the volumes of those procedures done. So it really is it's a balance that we want to make sure that we can protect our vulnerable citizens in long-term care homes, but also make sure that we can get to those surgeries that people have been counting on. It is a very anxious time for them. We certainly understand that. And so we are doing our best to make sure that we provide support in both of those areas. Okay, just as a follow-up, I'm not sure what's going to happen in terms of human resources, though, in nursing homes. The pandemic pay lasts for four months. It's retroactive, so it's going to be gone by the end of summer. How are you going to keep personal support workers uh, in, uh, in adequate levels in nursing homes? Are you going to get more nurses, as the nurses uh, organizations have called for, get more nurses into, into, into nursing homes to help take people and uh, direct the personal support work? Well, there's a number of issues involved in that question, as I'm sure that you realize, but fundamentally we need to make sure that first and foremost we have a safe workplace for people, whether it be nurses or our personal support workers. It has to be a clean environment, both for their sakes as well as for the residents' sakes. We want to make sure that they have the, uh, they are receiving the personal protective equipment, though it is being sent to all hospitals and long-term care homes that have requested it. There seems to be a concern with some staff in some of the homes being able to access the, uh, the supply that is there. So we need to straighten that issue out and make sure that the 
personal protective equipment that they need for doing certain procedures is there for them. We are also looking at a health human resources strategy for long-term care homes as well as hospitals and home and community care, and that there are other issues uh, relating to personal support workers that we know are keeping them from staying in that profession, that we are graduating uh, appropriate numbers of people, but they're not staying there. So there's terms of work, there's the conditions, there's the ability for them to work in one place instead of several places. That's really important to deal with in terms of infection prevention and control. So we're working on all of those issues to make sure that when the time comes for the uh, hospital staff to leave, that there will be the appropriate staff with the appropriate resources in our long-term care homes. So there's many items to that and we're working on all of them now. Next question. Next question comes from Mike Crawley from CBC News. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, hi first question for the pr Premier. Um, Premier, you've repeatedly declined to make public the list of long-term care homes that are in the various categories of red, yellow, and green. Um, given that you've said in the past that uh, you want the people of Ontario to see all of the data that you see, why is this particular piece of data an exception? Why won't you make it public? Well, before I hand it over to the Minister of Health, uh, very simply, what we, we're doing across the province, uh, we're doing surprise visits to all the long-term care homes. And, uh, you know, th this gives us an opportunity, no matter if it's uh, yellow or, or red, because th those are our priorities, to go in there. It, it wouldn't help, Mike, if uh, we told the folks in a long-term care home, yeah, we're coming in tomorrow, uh, get everything organized, and uh, we want to see how it operates day to day. But I'll pass this over to the Minister of Health. Well, yes, as the Premier indicated, it is really important that we be able to do those uh, sort of surprise audits or um, inspections to make sure that we can understand what the state of affairs actually is in a long-term care home whenever we uh, do go in. And as the Minister of Long-Term Care has also said that there are uh, homes that th there's a lot of movement, that some of the homes that might have been considered red several days ago may be yellow now or perhaps even green. So we want to make sure that we uh, do the assessments, it's the on-the-spot inspections that are really going to count. And we are making sure that we are supporting the homes, especially where the armed forces are right now, that we're following up with hospital support and public health support as well. We want to make sure that we can get all of the homes into a green situation as soon as possible. But it is really important that we do those inspections to, um, to really know what the situation is on the ground. And uh, I could follow up just back with the Premier. Uh, there was a previous question from John McGrath of TVO. Uh, he was asking about the migrant workers, but specifically what he asked about it, I don't think you addressed, which is, does the fact that there are now these outbreaks happening in uh, rural parts of Ontario uh, have an impact on your willingness to take a regional approach to reopening? In other words, does it slow down the possibility of reopening uh, Ontario in some of the areas that had until now been less affected than the urban areas? No, it's not going to affect that because uh, when we, we know the areas that it's happening in and, and in congregate living in a lot of these farms that they've had for years there, uh, it shouldn't uh, affect the rest of the community. We're going in there, we're going to start testing uh, the migrant workers and we're going to work with the the uh, farmers as well, as I mentioned earlier, Mike, that we gave them over $2 million. We've had 137 inspections already with 34 orders. We're going to continue uh, doing those inspections, but no, it's not going to slow down stage two for a regional opening. Last question. Last question comes from Rick Westhead from Sport Network. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Premier. Hi, Rick. Uh, the, National, the National Hockey League has talked about uh, its candidate cities to be a hub city, and Toronto is one of them. Uh, although it wants an exemption to the 14-day quarantine period that all arriving travelers face in coming back to Canada, do you support the, giving the NHL an exemption to that, uh, you know, 14-day quarantine? And how concerned would you be about the optics of doing that? Well, I've, I've talked to uh, the NHL, uh, like the other premiers have, and the federal government. They're currently working with the, the federal government. That would uh, fall under their, their jurisdiction. I've talked to the deputy uh, uh, prime minister about that as well, and uh, they're trying to sort things out. But uh, And we have to get the right definition 
uh, to the best of uh, all of our abilities to uh, to sit down with them and and would they consider uh, self isolation, staying in the hotel room, all hopping on the bus, going to the arena, and going back to the hotel room? Uh, that's going to be the federal government that uh, has that authority to decide if they're going to be coming in and staying two weeks or not. Uh, the NHL, uh, uh, the advice uh, or the information that I've received, I should say, from the NHL, that this is starting, uh, it would be starting in August the 1st, so it's almost two months away, and let's just hope the, the situation has changed uh, by then and we see numbers going down. I just can't tell you what the numbers are going to be uh, two months down the road, but the conversations have started. You, you mentioned earlier, I asked you about uh, this in Toronto, you mentioned that Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, the parent company of the Maple Leafs and Raptors, uh, would be paying for and buying its own tests, obtaining its own tests. Yes. Since then, the NHL has said that it would take between 25 and 30,000 tests to carry off this playoff this summer. Yeah. So beyond buying the tests, of course, you have to have those tests processed. Yeah. So how concerned are you that just if they're using the same labs, that regular Ontarians are using long-term uh, care facilities, et cetera, that it could overly tax the um, testing procedures? Well, I had the conversation uh, with uh, MLSC along with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Bettman as, as well. What I understand, they're going to be testing uh, their players every single day. Um, and uh, again, I'm no medical expert, but I think that's pretty good testing. So every day they get tested. Uh, and they're going to be paying for it all. On top of that, uh, they're using a, a private lab, not uh, a lab that, uh, what I understand, that we'd be using. So it's not going to interfere. And that's their number one concern uh, on the phone. They said, we do not want to take testing uh, away from, from the general public. That, that's not their goal. They want to make sure that their players and uh, the people that come with them uh, that are in a safe environment. They want to protect any any city that uh, they might end up in so we're two months down the road they're going to pay uh, for the testing they're going to use a private uh, lab they don't want to interfere with any uh, public testing uh, whatsoever so those are those are the items that I know and that, that's been communicated with me thank you that's it thanks so much everyone